is 24 hours uh, a day, but actually it may be slightly longer than that. So it, whether that has some uh, implications or not, don't know, but you know, day is 24 hours, but our circadian is actually slightly longer than that, okay? So the whole idea there about the circadian rhythm is that there are a lot of uh, biological processes going on in our body based on our circadian rhythm. And if you look at this picture, uh, let's start with six o'clock in the morning, okay? See what happens. At 6.45, we have the highest blood pressure. We Our blood pressure goes up. Then at seven o'clock or, oops, sorry. At about 7.30, the melatonin secretion goes down. And uh, because it is related with the with the uh, uh, night time, and we'll talk about that in a minute, then um, our best alertness is around 10 o'clock in the morning. Our uh, best coordination is around 2.30 in the afternoon. Our fastest reaction time is around 3.30 in the afternoon. And our greatest cardiovascular efficiency and muscle strength is about 5 p.m., okay? So that's the circadian rhythm involvement during the daytime. Now, as the night progresses from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., around 6 o'clock, we have the highest blood pressure. Now, our highest body temperature will be around 7 o'clock. And remember that because when we are going to talk about the sleep onset, we are going to talk about the temperature and regulation and stuff like that. And then at around 9 o'clock, the melatonin starts uh, building up, okay? That's our second uh, ZG bird that helps you go to sleep at night time. So, so nine o'clock, it goes up, your temperature goes down, your cortisol level starts coming down, and that's what initiates the sleep in a broader sense, although initiation of sleep is a very complicated process, but anyways, so melatonin starts secreting at around nine o'clock, and then uh, uh, about our deepest sleep is about two o'clock in the morning, and then finally about, 4, 4 a.m. is our nadir of the body temperature. And then when you wake up at 645, uh, your blood pressure goes up and cortisol level is high and your 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 pressure goes up. So most of the circadian rhythmicity actually is dependent on the daylight. OK, and the sun uh, and the external clues are called the Z-jeepers. So if you put somebody in a dark environment, like in a cave or something, they will lose that circadian rhythm, rhythmicity that is associated with our sun up and down. Uh, the second then thing that works there is the melatonin. Um, and so people who are blind or they, they are in a the dark, they lose that circadian rhythmicity. All right, so now, uh, how, how do we develop a circadian rhythm disorder? So if there is an alteration of the circadian timekeeping system, or there's an entrainment mechanism, which we're we gonna talk about, or misalignment of the endogenous circadian rhythm or the external environment like day and night and dark and time zones and those type of things. So now these classifications are coming from the um, IC, uh, ICSD, which is the International Classification of Sleep Disorders, and they define mm -hmm. a circadian rhythm disorder as a chronic or recurrent pattern of sleep-wake rhythm it is, uh, leads to either insomnia, hypersomnia, or both. So they are symptomatic with that. And it can cause significant disease or distress in mental, physical, social, occupational, educational, or other important areas of functioning. So, so the bottom line is it has, a, so one or two days of uh, a <clears throat> abnormal rhythmicity is not a circadian rhythm. I think it has to be at least three months or so before you can say, okay, this is a circadian rhythm disorder. It has to be associated with either hypersomnia or insomnia. And number three, it has to lead to some type of functional uh, or physical impairment, okay? All right. Now, whenever we talk about a circadian rhythm uh, uh, process, we have to talk about the normal circadian rhythmicity. And there are two processes that go on one is called the process S, the other is called the process C. Process S is also called that the sleep homeostasis process that is driven by adenosine. So when we wake up in the morning, the level of the adenosines are re reduced. As the day progresses, your level of adenosine actually keeps on going up and up. And you can see that uh, maybe around uh, nine o'clock in the evening, it, it's at its maximum. Now, the coffee actually works as an antagonist to that adenosine. So if you are sleepy, 
and you take the caffeine, it will be antagonist to your adenosine and it will push back this clock a little bit for backwards three by three or four hours and will give you more awakening for three to four hours. That's why your caffeine intake has to be very strategic and has to be taken with that word of caution because you don't want to take it right here in the in the late at night time because then your adenosine level is already going down and it may not be as effective as if you were to take it in the uh, afternoon or so and that will push you push it back. So now while that homeostatic process is going on at the same time your uh, your circadian process is also keeps on going up until we meet at around nine o'clock when both of these home process S and process uh, C, they meet with each other and that tends to initiate the sleep and we go into the sleep and that uh, that initiation of the sleep will replenish your adenosine back to zero and uh, and your circadian rhythm, which we're going to talk a little bit more about in a minute, uh, will get back to its bottom line. OK, and these all processes are being uh, intervene, intervened because with the light, with the temperature and uh, what you eat before you go to bed, social interactions, for example, watching uh, iPad, iPhones and those type of things. Now, actually, the reason for putting that diagram up is to just illustrate how complicated this process is. OK, it is not a simple <laughs> process. Um, and there are some genes that are also, by the way, involved in, in, in having these uh, different type of circadian rhythm disorders. The master pacemaker of uh, circadian rhythm is your suprachiasmatic nucleus, which gets an inference from optic nerve that tends uh, to give the signal from the from the light. And uh, so, and I'll show you in the next slide uh, what I mean by that. So, the stimulation of the suprachiasmatic uh, nu uh, nucleus of hypothalamus actually is the main control center. So, if the board question comes comes on, then that is the answer there. Now. There are two types of melatonin receptors. Melatonin one, when, when they are stimulated, they decrease the level of alerting from the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And the melatonin two receptors, whose stimulation will synchronize the circadian rhythm. And the genes that are involved, and you are going to get that on the board, the clock gene, OK? So or PR1, PR2, and PR3 genes. So and we'll talk about that uh, where these genetic disorders are linked to like delayed sleep phase syndrome, advanced sleep phase syndromes. But if they, the question is about the genetics of circadian rhythm, um, uh, and I think if there is a fair question on the board that they may ask you about the clock genes, okay? And this is diagram is very complicated. I'm not gonna go even into that, but just to illustrate how complicated sleep onset is and the control of the circadian rhythm is in the brain. It's not as simple as we are just talking about now at this point because it does interfere with a lot of other things. For example, uh, we talked about the bright light as the ZG bar. It affects on the retina. We have from the retina hypothalamic tract, it goes to your suprachiasmatic nucleus. It also then activates your lateral geniculate uh, uh, receptors, um, which then in turn uh, go through this genio hypothalamic tract and affect on the suprachiasmatic nu nucleus. Refi nuclei, they start secreting the serotonin or 5 hydroxytryptophan, and that then uh, gets all these signals from the suprachiasmatic nucleus, go to the median form, forebrain, to preganglion nucleons, to the spear cervical ganglions, then postganglionic neurons to the pineal gland that tends to secrete your melatonin, and then that affects on the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So on the one side is your pineal gland that's secreting the um, uh, melatonin. <laughs> on the other hand is your retina that's getting the in, uh, influx from the bright sunlight, and both of them are in, uh, affecting your suprachiasmatic nucleus along with the other hormones. Uh, uh, serotonin happens to be the most important of those. OK. All right. Now this is addressing and this actually I think is also has some practical implication. The relationship between the time and the core body temperature, <laughs> as I showed you earlier, that our body temperature starts dipping down around 9 or 10 o'clock and the nadir of that body temperature is about 4 a.m. Now, very interesting point is that it is almost very difficult to fall asleep unless your body temperature is not falling. If your your body and it has to be only like one one degree centigrade or something like that, but your body temperature has to come down. Uh, that's why a lot of people like to keep their bedrooms cooler than the rest of the house 
um, so that their body temperature will go down because you cannot fall asleep if your body temperature is still up, okay? And then it is very difficult for the, you to wake up in the morning if your body temperature is not rising. I'm giving you an example. People who become hypothermic, for example, go up on the mountains or something, they become hypothermic, they get drowsy. That's the reason because their body temperature is falling down and, and they cannot wake up. Their body temperature has to go up for them to be able to um, uh, wake up, okay? So this is a, now the relationship between the melatonin and the biological clock. And as you, you can see, and we talked a little bit about the same thing, you have perivascular nucleus, suprachiasmatic nucleus. So here from the eye, this impulse is going down the spinal cord to the superior cervical ganglion, to the eye pineal neuropathway, melatonin is produced in the pineal gland, and then it has a feedback on the perivascular nucleus and uh, controls on the suprachiasmatic nucleus. We'll talk a little bit more about melatonin business in a minute. So in terms of the melatonin, the secretion is increased around 8 o'clock or 10 o'clock, but it has to coincide with the dim light. If your lights are still up at night time, I mean, like you have um, bright daylight, um, your, your melatonin is not going to be uh, secreted at the proper timings. That's why you may have noticed that most of the times in the houses, you have a warm light at nighttime rather than the daylight bulbs. And the reason for that is because it the wavelength is such that it does not affect much on the uh, on the on the retina to stimulate your uh, uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus or interfere with the melatonin. So that's why you know there's a science behind having the the yellowish type of a light. And same way with the iPhones, they have changed that to night mode where your bright light is changed into the yellowish type of a light because of the uh, nanometers wavelength on those lights. So so at nighttime, typically when we go to uh, uh, when the lights are down your melatonin starts secreting. And this is a, a, a phenomenon called dim light melatonin onset. And there are kits available that you can get the melatonin levels from your saliva glands that can actually tell you what time your melatonin onset is. So, um, but, so here's the relationship between the temperature, the melatonin and the cortisol. And if you see here, at typically at uh, 11, uh, 10 or uh, 10 o'clock or 9 or 10 o'clock, your uh, melatonin starts secreting. It's, it gets to this maximum. Uh, your core body temperature starts dipping down and your serum cortisol level goes down and starts rising early in the morning. That is a question that will typically, they will ask serum cortisol levels in relationship with the sleep. And it is the highest in the early morning hours. And um, so they, that is a question even on the sleep board, they will typically ask about these hormones and cortisol relationship with the sleep and those type of things. But just remember, melatonin starts secreting around nine o'clock, core body temperature goes down, maximum nadir is around four o'clock, and serum cortisol level starts dipping down at night time, but it is at maximum early in the morning. That's why you get a fasting cortisol levels. <laughs> All right, so now let's go to the classification of the circadian rhythm disorders. And there are two types of circadian rhythm disorders. One is the intrinsic, the other is the extrinsic. The intrinsic circadian rhythm disorders are delayed sleep phase syndrome, advanced sleep phase syndrome, irregular sleep wakes rhythm disorder, non 24 hour. We are, we are going to talk about all those in a minute, okay? And then the extrinsic circadian rhythm disorders are the shift work and the jet lag, okay? So those are related to the external entrainment process that you get extrinsic circadian rhythm, but the intrinsic can be delayed, advanced, irregular, and non-24 hour, okay? So in, in a very simpler way, in a delayed sleep phase syndrome, people are unable to fall asleep even if they want to, and their typical sleep onset will be about two to four o'clock in the morning. And what happens, and this happens typically in adolescents, that they are unable to go to sleep they they have to wake up early for the school and so they are chronically sleep deprived because if you try to have them sleep early on and they are unable to go to sleep um, they will get three or four hours of sleep and then they don't wake wake up fresh they are hypersomnia contrary to that in the advanced sleep phase syndrome typically happens in older folks where they cannot resist their sleep and no matter what you try to keep them awake they will go to sleep typically five six seven o'clock in the afternoons 
and you cannot let them be awake till nine or ten, which is the normal sleeping time. And then the end result is their sleep cycle is normal, so they'll wake up early. They'll wake up four o'clock in the morning. So that's the advanced sleep phase syndrome. And then the irregular sleep wake syndrome is that people are sleeping at different um, timings during the day. Now, a non 24 hour sleep wake pattern actually is a progressively increasing time to, for the sleep onset. So, on one day, say you're going to sleep at 10 o'clock, then uh, two or three days down the line, you're sleeping at 11, then you're sleeping at midnight, then one o'clock. So, they keep on doing that as a cycle, which is called a non 24 hour sleep wake rhythm cycle. All right, so let's talk about the first one. As I said earlier, the delayed sleep phase uh, disorder is a significant delay in the onset of the sleep. OK, the symptoms have to be present for at least three months. Now, if you allow these people to sleep uh, and they will have a normal sleep cycle. So if they go to bed at two o'clock in the morning and you give them seven hours of sleep and they wake up at nine o'clock, they will be fresh. But if you allow them to wake up five o'clock or six o'clock, they will be sleep deprived and they will have symptoms. Typically happens in um, uh, younger uh, people. And uh, the way you can make a diagnosis is with sleep log, actigraphy. I mean, these days we have these Apple watches. They have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, apps there that you can also see what the sleep pattern is and those type of things. Uh, you can actually on the Apple watch, you can do that too. Works like an actigraph. <laughs> All right. Uh, overall prevalence is about 7 to 16%. Um, these are the night owls, and when they ask for the genetic predisposition, is the clock HPR3 gene, okay, clock gene, okay. If they, they, if they, if which gene is associated with the, what type of circadian is the delayed sleep phase syndrome, okay. So, so it could be a genetic predisposition, and along with the environmental factors that are making people uh, having delayed sleep phase syndrome, okay. Not everybody with the genetic uh, deficiency will get that. So environmental factors uh, can be the decreased exposure to light in the morning and uh, increased exposure to light in the evening. That's very difficult for teenagers or they consume too much caffeine, social or behavioral factors, or they have underlying ADHD, depression, bipolar, psychiatric uh, illnesses can also lead to delayed sleep phase syndrome. So you, the way you make a diagnosis, you get a questionnaire, morning question, evening questionnaire, time of sleep, sleep onset, how long does it take, how many hours you sleep, how do you do on the weekdays, how do you do on the weekends, um, and if you're allowed to sleep seven, eight hours, how do you feel, those type of things. Or you, and then you can do a sleep log. Sleep study is not necessary to make a diagnosis, okay? Actually, it's not even indicated. And, um, if you were to do their uh, uh, D element uh, element test, which I talked about earlier, the library gland melatonin, you will see that they're they will be delayed in the onset of their uh, melatonin at night times. So instead of nine o'clock, their melatonin may start secreting at about midnight or so. And you can see even their temperature that starts falling down is at a later stage, and their nadir will not be till six o'clock in the morning. Normally, we should have a minimum level at about four o'clock. These people may may not have their drop in the temperature till six o'clock, and their melatonin instead of getting started secreting nine o'clock, they will be delayed by about twelve o'clock. And and you can you can see that uh, actually, um, uh, actually the Apple has come up with their their new version which can monitor the temperature. And I wonder if uh, we can uh, use that uh, as a way to see that would be a cool way of doing it. The latest watch has the temperature thing. I they put it for a different reason, but I think we can use that for a different reason. Um, um, but I've not uh, tried that, but that will be my next thing to to play with. <laughs> Do you have the latest watch? I don't know if it's the latest one. The latest one has the temperature probe on it, but they I think they did that for the purposes of evolution and stuff like that in females. But I think you can probably use that for I'll be curious to see. So. so they might uh, give you huh? <laughs> so they, in, 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 in good old days, this was one of the typical on our boards. Uh, I mean, these uh, actigraph um, uh, pressings uh, and they wanted us to say what type of the sleep disorder it is. So there is timings up on the on the top and it will tell you what time did the patient go to sleep, what time did he wake up and whether, you know, it took a nap 
a lot. So you can see if the patient is uh, not going to sleep at eight or nine o'clock and going to sleep till one o'clock or so, uh, uh, you can tell that uh, this could be a delayed sleep phase syndrome. Um, problem is insurances don't pay for that. We don't, we're not doing that. And uh, uh, I mean, we are mostly making a clinical diagnosis at this time. Um, so how do we treat that? Okay, uh, obviously there are some uh, sleep hygiene stuff like that. The problem is that that if we ask these people to go to sleep at a specific time, it's not going to be successful. So somebody comes into me with a delayed safe syndrome and cannot go to sleep at two o'clock, and I tell him, oh, you should uh, try to go to bed at 10 o'clock. There's no way he will go to sleep by that time. He will be just keeping on tossing and turning. There, he cannot just go to sleep. So, um, so how do we do that? So the treatment is actually two or three options. One is a bright light exposure in the morning. And what you are trying to do is you are actually advancing the sleep phase. So now it has to be a blue green, a blue green light, uh, at least 2,500 lux for about two hours in the morning. So when they wake up in the morning, say they wake up, um, they have to go to work or they have to go to school, they wake up at six o'clock. Ideally, they, uh, you know, they should keep that bright light in their bathroom, turn it on, and then uh, uh, spend about a couple of, I mean, it's unrealistic to use two hours, but even 30 minutes to an hour maybe is sufficient. Um, so an exposure to bright light is what it's going to do is it's going to see here. It's um, it's going to push the clock backwards and then it may help them fall asleep a little bit earlier than their usual time, which is to one or two o'clock in the morning. The other thing you can give and do is you can give them some melatonin. Now, melatonin is a very interesting medication. So the whole uh, treatment with both delayed sleep phase syndrome and the advanced sleep phase syndrome is the concept of uh, advance and pull, okay? Uh, so on, with, the, with the bright light, you're pushing, uh, you're advancing it, and then with the melatonin, you're pulling it, okay? Advance and pull, okay? It's opposite in the advanced sleep phase syndrome. So the, and the two things, they work uh, opposite to each other. So delayed sleep phase syndrome, the treatment option, if they ask you on the boards, is the early bright morning exposure, okay? Advanced sleep phase syndrome is the evening exposure to the light. The melatonin, because you are now trying to pull that, you, you should ideally take it about five to seven hours before the sleep onset. You're not taking it as a sedative, but you are taking it as a, as a pull process. So you're trying to pull their uh, sleep phase syndrome to an earlier level by giving them the melatonin five to seven hours. Because th think about it, they are sleeping at two o'clock. And even if you were to give them at, uh, so five hours before that will be about nine o'clock, right? So if you give them uh, five to seven hours at nine o'clock, it may help them uh, sleep early, okay? Or you can use them uh, about one and a half hours before the desired bedtime. So if the desired bedtime is 10 p.m., then you can give them 8.30. If your desired time is 12 midnight, then you give them at 10.30. Uh, Follow me? So habitual, five to hour, seven hours before, or desired, 1.5 hours before. Follow that? Okay. It's very important to uh, <clears throat> know exactly what their current schedule is. Right. So when you give bright light, it has to be it should be given before CBT min. CBT min is this, um, core body temperature minimum, which is usually two hours before you wake up based on your circadian rhythm. At four o'clock in the morning. So but for, in, in those people, it's six o'clock. <laughs> so for example, if the patient wakes up at 10 p.m., that's a.m., sorry, they wake up 10 a.m., but they want to wake up at six. Uh, you want, if you want to give them bright light, you technically should give it only 8 a.m. or later. Yes. Not just wake up and go bright light. Like if you give it before 8 a.m., it actually may delay yeah. your sleep even more. So yeah, that's kind of and that's a very important point about the temperature and the and yeah. bright light. So therapy. It technically, has to be before after CBC after minimum, which is usually two hours before you wake up. So technically, let's say someone wakes up at like Dr. Khadr saying four. Six See, like here, in the morning. right, right here. Like in these people, maybe at six o'clock or so. Yeah. And then it starts rising. That's so if you give them right. about eight o'clock, uh, it may be reasonable, or after six o'clock. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's why I was saying the Apple Watch may be very helpful in yeah, that. So, <laughs> so ask you a question. So because when they ask you, you have to give bright light. At what time should you give bright light? You really need to know what their. They'll give it to you very clearly. What is their usual bedtime, lifetime? It is usual for them. 
what how do you want to fix it and then you decide what and actually the usual dose is no more than one to five milligrams okay i mean uh, the high the dose with the melatonin does not work the problem with the melatonin though is it is you don't when you're getting it over the counter you don't know if number one you're getting the exact dose that they are prescribing. I mean, they're saying on that. Number two, sometimes there can be some additives attached to that, like they may put uh, 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 valerian root or something like that, because most of these melatonins are, uh, people use that as a sedative. So it has to be a pure melatonin. And normally, um, uh, recommendation is to start with 1.5, then you go to uh, three, and then uh, no more than six milligrams, really. I mean, uh, if it is not helping, then beyond uh, six milligrams likely is not going to help that particular uh, uh, um, process, okay? Now, people with REM behavior disorder is a little bit different. The doses can be go, I think, as high as like 24 milligrams of melatonin mm -hmm. or something. So that's a little bit different, but we're talking about the delayed sleep phase syndrome. And then the third thing is um, chronotherapy. So what chronotherapy really is that, uh, and it's very hard to do, but uh, what this uh, is that, as I said earlier, if you ask them to sleep early, they won't be able to. But then in chronotherapy, you advance the clock. So gradually you tell them to sleep later and later till you reset their clock to the point where you desire them to go to sleep and then have them uh, fix that at that point. So there will be time during the days, for example, they'll be sleeping and stuff, which is very hard to really achieve. But uh, chronotherapy has been suggested as a mode of... Uh, it's like, let's say well, someone wakes up at noon. So instead of trying to pull it back, you tell them, OK, go go sleep at 2 p.m. And then next day, 4 p.m. And then so 6 p.m. You get to the 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, and then you say, OK, now fix your time from... So advancing the clock... Uh, easier. The, it's uh, easier advanced. than pulling that out, okay? Yeah, that's why delayed sleep phase syndrome is common because people have a propensity to mm -hmm. delay. They like to sleep later, wake up later. Um, that's where the issue is. All right, now let's talk about the advanced sleep phase syndrome. So this is opposite to the delayed sleep phase, uh, phase syndrome. Again, the symptoms have to be present for at least three months. Now, if you allow them to sleep in their own internal biology clock, they have no problem. The problem happens, most of these elderly people, they cannot resist their sleep and they have to go to bed. So they can miss their social interactions in the after evening with the family members and stuff like that. By the time their you know, kids come home or something, I mean, they're already gone to sleep and then they, so, but then they wake up very early in the morning and then they, they, they feel very lonely about it. So um, it is also present in about 7% of the people aged between 40 to 64 years of age as you grow uh, uh, advanced. Now the genetic here is HPR2 genetic gene, okay? And uh, um, you can also see that in, in kids who have neurodevelopmental disorders like ASD and uh, environmental factors may um, precipitate, maintain, or exacerbate. Again, the way you make that diagnosis is either by looking at the body temperatures and uh, dim light melatonin onset um, through the slavic glands and you can use the kid and you can see where time there. And these people typically will have the melatonin onset earlier than eight or nine o'clock. And they may be having melatonin onset at maybe five or six o'clock in the evening. Um, um, it can be non-familiar and highly variable. So, I mean, this is the actigram, which shows basically, you know, um, around six o'clock, you you're, you're start sleeping and then you're waking up very early in the morning. So that would be on the actigram. You can see that uh, same way, like we did the delayed sleep phase syndrome, their melatonin secretion uh, is starting very early and their body temperature is going down very early also. So here, now what you can do is you can give them a, a, a bright light therapy one to three hours uh, before the beginning at the time that they usually experience evening sleepiness. So if they experience sleepiness at 7 p.m., giving them a bright light therapy, maybe five o'clock in the evening may, may help there. That may be much easier to do it uh, because, you know, five o'clock is still sort of daytime and you can do that. Um, now, in this situation, uh, people have tried giving them the melatonin in the morning so that you delay the circadian rhythmicity um, because uh, look at the melatonin secretion, right? It starts and then at the time when you wake up, it's at its lowest level. 
So if you give them the melatonin at that time, you're basically pushing the, the whole sleep cycle downwards, okay? So it's opposite the push and pull to the bright light therapy. And uh, so in bright light in the late sleep phase, you give in the morning, you the give morning. melatonin in the evening, but it's the other way, you, you give them the uh, bright light in the evening and melatonin in the morning. Uh, okay. And again, you can try chronotherapy, but sometimes it doesn't help. So now let's talk about irregular sleep wake cycle. This is a chronic or recurrent pattern of irregular sleep and wake episodes through our 24 hour period. There's no clearly defined circadian rhythm of sleep. And a typical example I'll give you is uh, somebody on a shift calls, like we read and yeah. everything. I mean, you're sometimes sleeping, sometimes you're not sleeping, sometimes you're doing this, you're taking two hours of nap here and two hours there and this and that. So that's very irregular sleep wake cycle. Uh, I think that's a, and that can lead to excessive sleepiness, insomnia, symptoms have to be there for at least three months. And you can keep a sleep diary and uh, the sleep disturbance is not explained by another disorder, like sleep apnea or something like that. Uh, typical people who can get into this can be people with Alzheimer's or Parkinsonism, uh, other some William syndrome, Sid smith megan syndrome, poor sleep hygiene. Um, that's what residents we do. <laughs> uh, or lack of exposure to external synchronizing agents like light if you're working in, like in a hospital, dim light, I mean, uh, all that will, uh, uh, can predispose to irregular sleep wake cycle, uh, traumatic brain injury, brain tumors, especially affecting the hypothalamic pituitary axis. So again, you can take a history, you can do a sleep log, actigraph monitoring, and um, and then the um, so there is no clear correlation between your core body temperature and dim light melatonin onset. Uh, actigraph will show you you're sleeping at different times uh, of the day. So the goal here is to have one long night sleep at night and one long awake time during the day. How do you achieve that? That's the real thing, okay? Uh, people have tried light treatment. That's a weak recommendation. Melatonin also a weak recommendation. Re really, basically, you have to adjust your, your sleep cycle here so that you can get a good night's sleep so that you are awake all day long. And, uh, and uh, I mean, typically, say, for example, you are on a call one night and you're awake all night long, it will take you at least... 48 to 72 hours to get back to your normal rhythm. So there is a delay in, so one night of sleep after a night call does not fix your problem. It, you need at least two nights of sleep to fix that problem there. Like a week. <laughs> like a week, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so now this non-24 hour sleep wake rhythm disorder used to be called in the past as a free running sleep disorder or non-entrained disorder. Non-entrained means that people are not having any any cues from outside. They changed the terminology in the third edition to non-24 hour sleep wake rhythm disorder. And uh, basically this is a typical example. People will be who are blind or who don't who are in the uh, in, in, in caves or something. Um, almost 50% of the people who are blind may have this disorder. Also people with de developmental intellectual disability may have this. And they may present with sleep delayed sleep aches uh, syndrome, and then that can lead to non-24 hour sleep where uh, wake problems, dementia, traumatic brain injury, all those could be. So the whole idea there is you can see there that uh, there's a progressive prolongation of this deep onset. So when you see on the boards, they give you an actigram that's like progressively uh, sleep onset is getting longer and longer. I mean, the onset is going uh, longer and longer, like sleeping from 10 to 11, 11 to 12, 12 to 1. So when there's a, a line, that's a non-24 hour, simple answer there. You don't have to look at anything else. That's a non-24 hour sleep wake pattern. It's not irregular. It's, there's a rhythmicity to that, remember that, because their sleep onset is getting progressively longer. They may be sleeping seven hours or so, and they may be awake in the daytime, but their sleep onset is getting progressively longer and longer because they have lost that external cue that uh, is regulating their suprachiasmatic nucleus to day and night, uh, 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 rhythmicity, okay? All right, no specific recommendations. You can now here, you can use melatonin as an agonist because you have lost the external cues and especially in the blind people. And uh, I have had patients like, for example, they were on home ventilators and stuff and staying in the room and everything. And melatonin does work. You, get, you have to give that at the proper time. And, uh, uh, and that's, uh, especially in blind people, it may help you there. So this is a summary of all these um, uh, uh, 
uh, sleep disorders, advanced sleep phase, delayed sleep phase, non-24, and uh, irregular sleep wake. And really, to be honest with you, most of these recommendations are either no recommendations or they're weak recommendations. Okay, we talk about them, but um, based on the uh, ICSD, I mean, um, they 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 are really not recommending. Uh, uh, as a strong recommendation. I mean, they're talking about light therapy and uh, sleep promoting medications and everything, uh, but really there there's no big specific treatment that uh, you can go by. Now let's talk about extrinsic circadian rhythm disorders, and two of them are, one is the shift work, the other is the jet lag disorder, and almost all, all of us have experienced the jet lag disorder. So shift work disorder is actually uh, due to reduction in the total sleep time, associated with recurring work schedule that overlaps the usual time of the sleep. Symptoms are present for at least three months and sleep log will show like a, a irregular sleep wake cycle. And uh, so now people who tend to develop that would be on the number one type of the shift. So what is being recommended is that if you have to change a shift, change it on a week to week basis and advance it from day to afternoon to the evening. So for example, First week you are on say 8 to uh, 7 p.m. and then the next week you're 7 to 11 or 12 p.m. and then the third week you are at uh, the night time. So eight hour shift. So you advance that. Um, you don't go from day to night. It's better to get, go from day to afternoon and then night or night to day uh, 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 type of a thing. If you have that luxury of eight hour shift uh, and you, you if you shift it on a week to week basis, um, that is preferred as compared to every two days change or every three days change in a shift work, okay? Uh, so the way you diagnose, obviously you get a good history, sleep log, accurate graphics, again, sleep study is not recommended. Now, these are the consequences of the shift work. I talk a lot about when I give the yearly lecture on the, you know, resident shift work and all that type of thing. But the bottom line is, you know, they can have a lot of psychological, medical, uh, social issues with the chronic sleep deprivation due to shift work. And uh, um, so obviously the treatment is going to be to eliminate the shift work if it is possible. Try to schedule your sleep and we talk about the anchor sleep. We talk about the, um, 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 uh, we talk about uh, short naps. We talk about uh, uh, the uh, sleeping a couple of hours before getting into the night shift. Um, short acting hypnotics may be helpful if you have time or luxury. You can try the low dose melatonin um, about 30 minutes before you go to sleep. That, that may help. And uh, then we talk about the use of caffeine. And this is all in during my you know lecture on that. Uh, so I'm not going to go into those detail. Um, and then uh, timed exposure to the bright light, which is very important actually. So if you can get about 4, 20 minutes break during the daytime and get exposed to the bright light, if you have that luxury, that will be very helpful because it will keep sending the sig signal to your brain that it's daytime, stay awake. Now, let's check, talk about jet lag disorder. And uh, actually, it all depends on how many time zone you cover, okay? And um, so after seven time zones, um, you go back to the basis, okay? So if you are changing your time zones, at least uh, up to seven time zones, you are gonna have some type of a jet lag, okay? And it all depends on whether you're traveling eastward or the westward, okay? Now, interestingly, the older individuals may actually experience less jet lag compared to the younger people. And I think the reason for that is the younger population has a more propensity for stage three sleep. and having them wake up from stage three sleep, they're a lot more symptomatic compared to older people who lack that stage three sleep. And that's why they're less affected than the younger population. But it does affect everybody. So this is the um, the the issue with the eastward and the westward travel. So if you're traveling east, for example, you're going to London or Middle East or something, you need to advance of circadian dry, uh, timing to adjust to the new time zone up to seven time zones. After seven time zones, you're back to baseline. Then it does not impact much. Uh, and it also requires a delay of the circadian timing to adjust to the new time zone. And we'll talk about strategies there. Westward travels require actually a delay of the circadian timing to 
adjust to a new time zone. And you can you can take the example uh, of um, uh, both advanced sleep phase and the delayed sleep phase syndrome. And you can see, for example, traveling from here to California, there's a three hours difference, right? Mm -hmm. So when it is 10 p.m. here, it would be 7 p.m. and you are there at, at their clock, right? It's way better to adjust and stay awake till 10 o'clock and adjust to the time zone than traveling east zone. So let's say you travel now three hours east uh, towards east and your normal sleeping time is 10 o'clock. By the time you reach there, it's 2 a.m. OK, what is happening at 2 a.m.? You're very sleepy and tired. Now you go to bed at 2 o'clock, but then you have to wake up with their time, which is 8 o'clock. You're definitely restricting your sleep to five or six hours. And that's that's not sufficient to overcome this jet lag here on the west coast. Now you, you reach there at 7 o'clock, you get to their time at 10 o'clock, even if you're up for those three hours, but you still will have seven, eight hours of sleep till 8 o'clock next morning, and you can compensate for that sleep loss. Follow me? So it is much easier to travel, uh, to compensate, and they saw that actually in uh, these football teams. When they were coming to play from California to Boston, they will perform poorly, but when they were going to California, they were performing very well. <laughs> so. So it all has to do with the time travel zones. OK, westward is easy to adapt. Eastward is very hard to adapt. All right, so here, you know, I mean, you obviously have the history there and it's, there's a, uh, the whole problem is the mismatch between the timings of the sleep and the wakefulness. So how do we fix that problem? So to for eastward travel, like going to London or Middle East, um, you move your bedtime and the wake time 30 minutes earlier per day, starting three days prior to the departure. OK, so if you normally sleep at 10 o'clock, maybe start sleeping 930, 9, 830. So you move uh, your uh, uh, sleep time earlier to compensate for some of that uh, time loss. OK, also to facilitate the shift, avoid the light in the evening and seek bright light in the first two to three hours in the awakening. Again, remember that delayed sleep phase syndrome. Mm -hmm. So it's basically the same thing as a delayed sleep phase syndrome where you, uh, you, if you are exposed to the bright light in the morning, it may reset your clock and uh, you may be able to sleep earlier because by the time you're, you're eastward traveling, you're losing time. So instead of, you know, you start here at 10 o'clock and you're, you reach there um, in three hours later, which is there, you know, here, you know, it's, two, two, it's actually it's three plus three, six a.m. in the morning. So, so you're losing double the amount of time, three hours into travel and three hours that time zone like this. So, so you're losing that uh, double the amount of time. And during the, uh, during the travel, you can set your watch to the destination time, okay? Not to the local time here. And uh, uh, then when you get to your destination, try to avoid the bright light. So basically, say you're traveling from here to Middle East. By the time you get there, it will be early morning, like nine o'clock in the morning or something. And then, but think you have traveled six time zones. So six hours back, that's still your nighttime here. Yeah. And uh, so if you now are exposed to the bright light, your brain is going to think it's the daytime and it will just mess up with your whole. So the better thing is avoid the bright light, use the sunglasses on the plane, uh, avoid attempt slept during the destination nighttime. So if you can stay awake till the evening hours of their local time, it may help you readjust very quickly because then you can get seven hours of sleep. Um, so uh, they are not recommending the uh, any medications, but uh, sometimes you can take melatonin uh, at the desired destination bedtime. So basically when you go to um, uh, eastward travel, you get there, try not to sleep during the daytime, and then nine o'clock or 10 o'clock, what's your time? Take about three milligrams of melatonin and that may help you sleep. And then you can get back to the normal range. Yeah. So um, now you can do in the daytime there, you can take short naps, less than 45 minutes and caffeine may also help uh, daytime. So, I mean, we are in the habit of when we travel eastwards, go to sleep uh, at the destination and that just kills it, okay? Uh, try not to get to the bright light, try to stay awake. You can take a little bit of a caffeine and so that by the night time comes in, if you are unable to sleep at that time, 
um, because remember that will be deadline here, right? So um, it all depends how many time zones you're traveling though. Because uh, usually when you're shifting, it's 30 minutes an hour per day. That you yes. Shift. So it's not like you, even if it will take some time to adjust for your circadian rhythm to shift to the new. For uh, eastward travel, sometimes can take up to a week. Right. So, it's typically three to seven days. Now, westward travel, very quick, one to three days, you will be fine. <laughs> or sometimes not even that. I mean, you'll be fine because you're able, you're arriving at your destination earlier. I mean, um, I mean, it has happened so many times to me when I'm traveling from, say, Pakistan or eastward, come here on Sunday, I'm able to work Monday morning. But when I get there, oh, I'm miserable for two, three days. I mean, it's, it's total misery. Yeah. I mean, uh, but traveling westward, no problem. You're here three, four o'clock. You, you get back, back home. You're able to sleep by 10 o'clock. And next morning, you're uh, as good as uh, you ever have been. So, so that's, the, that's the whole idea. Now, westward travel is uh, opposite to that. So you move your bedtime um, towards uh, longer. Like if you're going to bed at 10 o'clock, go to 10.30, 11, 11.30, uh, move it by 30 minutes uh, every day, three days prior to that. And uh, during the travel, you get a lot of afternoon and evening uh, destination bright light, which most of that, like yeah, I'm going to California, I'm there by four or five o'clock and there's a lot of sunshine. You get exposed to that sunshine at that time. And um, and then you 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 try to sleep at the des their destination desired time, okay? And on arrival, gets lots lots of afternoon and evening bright sunlight. Uh, avoid bright light during destination night time. Marathon here may not be helpful. And try to stay up uh, the desired destination bedtime. Avoid evening nodding off. Staying asleep may be difficult for the first few days. Short naps and caffeine may help with alertness, but most of the times you will do very well on the westward travel than the eastward. Eastward is the hardest thing. So, all right, that's the last one. I'm so good at sleeping. I can do it with my when eyes closed and I can. <laughs> I hope that was helpful. I mean, if you have any questions, I'm mean, happy to answer you guys, but uh, uh, they will ask one or two questions, I think, on circadian rhythm and uh, and they make it um, I, I to know that.